Good afternoon. The Secretary General will brief you uh, on the extraordinary meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Commission, uh, and then we'll take uh, a couple of questions here in the room uh, and online. Secretary General. Good afternoon. We have just uh, finished an extraordinary meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Commission. We condemn Moscow's decision to recognize the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic. Uh, we also condemn the further Russian incursion into Ukraine. Moscow has uh, now moved from covert attempts to destabilize uh, Ukraine to uh, overt uh, military action. This is a serious escalation by Russia and a flagrant violation of international law. It further undermines Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It damages efforts to find a peaceful resolution to the conflict, and it has grave consequences for European security. This is a crisis created by Russia alone. We commend Ukraine for its restraint in not responding to Russia's repeated provocations. We stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people and its government. Allies are united in their full support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. We will continue to provide Ukraine with strong political support and allies are providing equipment to help Ukraine defend itself as well as sustained financial support. For months, Russia has been building up a massive military force in and around Ukraine, including in Belarus, with well over 150,000 troops and fighter jets and attack helicopters. Many units are now forward deployed in combat formations. They are out of their camps in the field and ready to strike. NATO is resolute and united in its determination to protect and defend all allies. In the last weeks, allies have deployed thousands of more troops to eastern part of the alliance and placed uh, more on standby. We have over 100 jets at high alert and there are more than 120 allied ships at the sea from the high north uh, to the Mediterranean. We will continue to do whatever is necessary to shield the alliance from aggression. NATO allies and the rest of the international community warned there would be a high cost if Russia carried out further aggressive actions against Ukraine. I welcome the economic sanctions announced today by many NATO allies and the decision by the German government that it cannot certify the North Stream 2 pipeline. We urge Russia in the strongest possible terms to choose the path of diplomacy. This is the most dangerous moment in European uh, security for a generation. But Europe and North America continue to stand strong together in NATO, united and committed to defend and protect each other. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, uh, we'll go to Ukraine form here. Uh, Dmitry Skurko, National News Agency of Ukraine. As NATO have a quite transparent policy in the situational assessment, could you please share the vision? Uh, have you discussed with Ukrainian side uh, uh, the uh, possibility that Russian troops will not stop on the contact line and will be moving deeper, at least to the administrative borders of uh, the Lugansk and uh, Donetsk uh, areas. And what will be the reaction of NATO in that regard? And the follow-up question, if I may, uh, what is your assessment? How high is still a risk uh, of a uh, false flag operation from the Russian side? Thank you. Every indication uh, is that uh, Russia continues to plan for a full-scale attack on uh, Ukraine. Uh, we see the ongoing military build-up. They promised to step back, but they had continued to step up. 
We see that more and more of the forces are moving out of the camps and are in combat formations and ready to strike. And we see the ongoing provocations in Donbass and the different uh, false flag operations where they try to create a pretext for an attack. And then, of course, we saw uh, last night that uh, further Russian troops moved into uh, Donbass, uh, into uh, parts of Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, and then we have the threatening rhetoric, which was actually confirmed in the speech of President uh, Putin yesterday. At the same time, it's never too late. It's never too late to not attack. And that's the reason why we continue to call on Russia to step uh, back, uh, to de-escalate, and to engage in good faith in diplomatic uh, efforts to find a political uh, solution. If Russia decides once again to use force against Ukraine, there will be even uh, stronger sanctions, even a higher price to pay. Um, allies continue to provide support to Ukraine. Uh, and in the meeting with Ukraine today, many allies uh, pledged continued support, financial support, uh, support military support, uh, uh, and also NATO provides uh, critical support to help uh, Ukraine strengthen its cyber defenses. Uh, and of course, NATO's uh, main responsibility is to make sure that there is uh, no aggression against any NATO allied countries. So we have already increased our presence in the, in the eastern part of the alliance and we're ready to further increase our presence in the eastern part of the alliance if necessary. Associated Press. Thank you. Mark Carlson, Associated Press. Do you consider Russia's latest movements an invasion of Ukraine? I think we have to recall that Russia has already invaded Ukraine. They invaded Ukraine back in 2014. They annexed the part of Ukraine, Crimea, and uh, since 2014 there have been uh, Russian military units, forces in Donbas, in Donetsk and Luhansk. So what we see now is that a, a country which is already invaded uh, is suffering further invasion and, uh, and with more uh, Russian military presence. And this is, of course, uh, even more serious because, um, because uh, this comes on, on top of the recognition uh, of the so-called people's republics uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk. So what we see is further invasion of a country which is already invaded. We'll now go online to uh, Greg Palkett from uh, Fox News. Thanks very much, Juana, and thank you, uh, Secretary General. I, I really have to be precise about this because uh, uh, there's been a bit of uh, confusion. You say last night further Russian troops entered the Donbass. Do you have evidence that Russian troops, vehicles, men, gear, have moved from Russian territory into, well, it's really Ukrainian territory, but it's the occupied Donbass. Do you have evidence of that? And if so, that is an invasion, correct? And if so, have you changed your posture at all? But, but specifically about that point, do you have evidence that new Russian troops have moved from Russia into the Donbass, that is the occupied territory of Ukraine? Yes, uh, and I think again we have to understand that Russia has been in Donbass uh, for many years, since 2014. But that has been in a, in a uh, covert operation where they have denied their presence. But the so-called separatist has been controlled by and supported by uh, Russian troops, uh, Russian special, uh, special operation uh, uh, personnel uh, for many, many years. So Russia has been present in different covert operations in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, for many, many years. What we see now is additional Russian fo forces and troops moving in. Um, and uh, and uh, this makes the whole situation even more serious. This is a step change. Uh, and then uh, this is combined with the um, recognition uh, of these territories, uh, which are inside the international recognized borders of Ukraine as independent states. So this is adding fuel, this is making it more dangerous and more serious, and, uh, and then on top of that we also see the continued Russian military build-up and preparation for a larger scale uh, attack on Ukraine. Okay, we'll go to Nicolas Barot uh, from Le Figaro.
Nicolas. You'll need to unmute yourself. Do you, do you hear me? Um, can you give us a precise view on the military forces and assets that are deployed by Russia near the border and in Donbass and, and the forces from the, the separatists? You, you talked about um, 150,000 troops, but um, could be more precise. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, what I can say is that uh, Russia has uh, well over 150,000 troops. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there are air forces and naval forces also close to uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, these uh, forces are uh, partly inside Ukraine already, in Crimea and in Donbass, uh, and partly close to Ukraine's borders, uh, both in the, in the, in the east, uh, uh, but also in the south, uh, and also uh, in the north, partly in Russia and partly in, in Belarus. And uh, these forces are combat ready, uh, tens of thousands of combat troops, but also uh, all kinds of enablers, um, missiles, uh, armored vehicles, battle tanks, drones, uh, 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 systems for electronic warfare, uh, air defense, uh, Iskander missiles, which are actually dual capable missiles, and uh, a wide range of different military capabilities. So this is a force which is not only strong and well equipped and have a, a lot of high-end capabilities, but is also a force which is now um, fully uh, resourced with ammunition and fuel, and then uh, more and more of the troops have moved out of their camps and now are, are now in a, in a position where they can uh, uh, attack uh, without any warning time. So, of course, this makes the whole situation very dangerous, but as we have stated again and again, uh, Russia still has a choice to choose diplomacy, to step back, and to engage in a political dialogue with NATO allies. And we have demonstrated over a long period of time that we are ready to sit down uh, to, uh, uh, to, to talk to Russia in good faith uh, on issues which also matters for their security, arms control, uh, transparency, and many other issues. Uh, we'll go to Terry Schultz from uh, National Public Radio. Hi, thank you very much for taking our remote questions. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, um, do you worry that, uh, that Russia is uh, declaring that it will also recognize this sovereignty, um, you can, can't see my fingers, over uh, parts of, of Ukraine that are currently controlled by Ukrainian forces? That seems that it would, it would make the, the probability of conflict a lot higher. And with the Baltic states and other, uh, other neighboring allies calling for yet more support, even more than NATO has done so far, what more can you do right now practically? Not what you've done so far, but what more can you do in the very near future, in the next days, to reassure those nervous allies? What you have seen is a bit the mixed signals from uh, Moscow on whether they have recognized uh, the territory between the Russian border and the contact line or recognized uh, as uh, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics uh, the whole territory of the two oblasts. Uh, but anyway, this is a step change. This is uh, further increasing uh, the threats um, and the violation of uh, 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 Ukraine's territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty, just the fact that they have recognized these entities uh, as independent uh, states. Um, uh, and that's the reason why we condemn it so clearly, uh, and also the reason why uh, we welcome the sanctions that uh, NATO allies uh, today uh, in different formats have decided to impose, and also why I welcome the decision by Germany to uh, stop uh, the, um, the approval of the North Stream uh, uh, 2 project. Um, uh, we have already increased our presence uh, in the Baltic states. Um, we did so after, uh, 20, uh, so, uh, uh, after the legal annexation of Crimea in 2014, um, and uh, we have also done it over the last uh, weeks and months. Uh, then we have plans in place. Uh, we have uh, forces available to reinforce further if needed. We will do that in a defensive way. Uh, our purpose is to prevent the conflict, it is to reassure uh, allies. And of course, NATO's core responsibility 
is to make sure that there is no room for any miscalculation about our uh, commitment to protect and defend allies and by that also prevent any attack on any allied uh, uh, country. For the next question, we'll go to Jeff Shogo from Task and Purpose. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, has the NATO response force been activated? If so, how many troops are deploying to Europe? Thank you. The NATO response force uh, has um, been put on higher readiness. Uh, we, done, we did that uh, several weeks ago, uh, but it has not been deployed. Uh, what we have deployed are other units of, uh, from NATO allied countries. Uh, uh, the United States has deployed uh, troops and forces in Europe. I met some of them in Romania a few days ago. Uh, Germany has deployed more uh, troops to Lithuania. Uh, the United Kingdom has doubled its presence in, in Estonia uh, with a battle group there um, um, and other allies, um, including um, uh, Spain, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, uh, and many others have decided to send in troops, ships, and planes to reinforce our presence. And France has also made it clear that they, they are ready to lead a battle group uh, in, um, in Romania. So. Um, so far, we have increased the readiness of the NATO response force, uh, but we have not deployed the NATO response force. Thank you. For the next question, we'll go to Ketevan Kardava from Imedi TV. Hello. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, latest news uh, from uh, Russia. Putin asks lawmakers for permission to use force outside Russia could pave the way for broader attack on Ukraine. How would you comment on um, this issue? And also yesterday, Putin spoke a lot about NATO expansion. And you know that uh, with Ukraine, Georgia is also uh, waiting for future membership at, and such statements are so worried for us. What is your comment and is it possible um, uh, and acceptable uh, about what uh, Putin was talking two days ago, uh, so-called moratorium on uh, NATO expansion? Thank you so much. A request uh, to get permission to use uh, force outside the Russian, Russian territory just adds to the pattern of uh, decisions and actions by Russia over the last uh, months, uh, which has led to the most dangerous moment uh, for our security in decades. And this, just, and this is just another step. Uh, I think we have to recall that actually uh, NATO and NATO allies um, uh, warned this fall uh, that uh, we saw uh, uh, a military buildup by Russia and plans uh, to reach uh, a level of Russian forces in and around Ukraine, which is very much uh, where we are today. So this, this, is, this is something that has been predicted uh, many months ago. And then uh, Russia has done what uh, we expected uh, and what we warned against. Uh, they have uh, significantly uh, increased uh, their military presence in and around Ukraine. And then combined with the rhetoric and, and all the uh, and all the uh, false flag operations, the attempts to create a pretext, uh, and now uh, yesterday the uh, recognition of uh, the People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk, all of that adds into this pattern of uh, threatening and aggressive behavior, and any permission to use force outside the Russian territory just adds uh, to uh, that pattern. Um, it, fundamentally doesn't change our message, and that is that uh, we continue to call on Russia to step back, not to, to continue to step up, as we've seen over the last uh, weeks, uh, but also uh, that they um, uh, engage in uh, real diplomatic efforts. Uh, NATO has made it clear that we are ready to talk, uh, and we have listed uh, in uh, letters, or in, in the letter we have sent to Russia, but also the United States has conveyed um, a document to Russia in parallel with NATO, where we list many areas where we're ready to uh, sit down, discuss, uh, and try to find a political path uh, forward. Uh, but in that document, we also made it clear that we will not compromise on core values. Um, and one of them is, of course, the right for every nation to choose its own path. Um, NATO enlargement has been extremely important for Europe over many decades. It helps to spread democracy 
freedom across Europe uh, for decades after the end of the Cold War. And uh, we will uh, neither compromise nor right to protect and defend all allies. When Russia is demanding that we should sign a legally binding agreement uh, to uh, remove all NATO infrastructure and all NATO forces uh, from the territories of those uh, 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 allies that joined the alliance after 1997, we cannot accept that because that will be the same as to say that uh, we will introduce some kind of first and second class NATO membership where we don't have the same right to protect those allies that joined after 1997. Uh, so we will not compromise on those principles, but we are ready to engage in political dialogue on many important issues, which are also important for uh, the security of Russia. For the last question, we'll go to Doug Bladet and uh, Brage Di Gior. Hi. Uh, people around the world, and especially in Europe, are now afraid of a full-on war. Uh, what do you think of that fear, and uh, how far away are we? Well, there is a real risk, uh, and uh, that's exactly why we have been warning against this for months. Uh, and regrettably, what we have seen over the last months is uh, that uh, exactly what we predicted has happened. Uh, but it's still possible for Russia to change course and uh, to uh, not continue the military build-up and not invade uh, further uh, Ukraine. Um, I think also that we need to, to realize that um, Ukraine is a highly valued partner. We support them. Uh, with military support, with, uh, with political support, uh, with the cyber defenses, with equipment. Different allies provide different types of support. Uh, but when it comes to NATO allies, we provide absolute security guarantees, meaning that we make it absolutely clear that an attack on one ally will trigger a response from the whole alliance, one for all, all for one. And, uh, and that's uh, also the reason why NATO has increased its presence in the eastern part of the alliance in a defensive uh, manner uh, to make sure that uh, there is no room uh, for miscalculation about our ability to defend all allies. And as long as we do that, uh, we, will, uh, we will prevent an attack on NATO allied uh, countries. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. Thank you. Thank you.